I am Dana Giel. Uh, I'm um, one of the professors in the Department of Urology for Pediatric Urology and also the uh, program director for our fellowship in Memphis, Tennessee at both, <clears throat> excuse me, Le Bonheur Children's Hospital and uh, St. Jude um, Children's Research Hospital. I wanted to thank um, Dr. Hillary Kopp for the opportunity of, um, of putting this together and having me uh, participate. I think this is a great platform and a really excellent use of um, some additional time that we all are finding ourselves with this today. So congratulations to Hillary for putting this together and um, thanks to Michelle uh, for um, being a wonderful support from the technical side. So we'll get started with uh, the, the lecture. I do not have any disclosures to report today. Um, we will, uh, you know, this is a pretty straightforward topic. I think a lot of people have exposure to this from both the adult side during residency as well as in uh, pediatric urology fellowship. It is a bit different for adolescents than maybe the adults that we've treated in the past. Um, and we have to have some special considerations. I think it's always good to start with uh, understanding exactly what it is that we are talking about. So obviously a varicocele is abnormal dilation and tortuosity of the internal spermatic veins within the pampiniform plexus. You'll often hear it referred to as a bag of worms and that is uh, physically what you can kind of feel or even maybe see on some of the patients with varicosities um, in the spermatic cord. Um, a bit of a historical perspective, I thought this was a great, um, a great quote and uh, from an early version of Campbell's. Um, and it said, generally, it's induced by faulty sexual hygiene and especially habitual masturbation, repressed sexual desire or habitual and wholesome sex thinking, which maintains a more or less constant pelvic congestion. So uh, my, how times have changed. Thankfully, we um, aren't necessarily in that mindset anymore. And I'm sure our patients are grateful that we now know that this is an actual uh, pathophysiologic process and not necessarily something to do with the way they think or act. Um, so this is one of the most well-known things that we actually don't know enough about. Um, we all think we know about varicoceles, we know what they are, um, oftentimes we even know how to make them go away, um, and sometimes we know uh, that we don't need to make them go away, but it is controversial because we don't know exactly what the implications of a varicocele are. We do know that they contribute to subfertility, um, but we're not exactly sure how how that happens and we also know that uh, the effects on paternity are unclear as about 80 to 85 percent of men with varicoceles have actually fathered children so if that's true why do they become important and why are they something that we do talk about in the same context as talking about male infertility so um, there's a lot of unknowns and there's a lot of controversy and a lot of um, personal ways of doing things that make this um, topic a little bit less um, concrete in its foundations and in its applications than perhaps some of the other things that we end up talking about when we uh, practice pediatric urology. So what do we know about varicoceles? Well, we know that this um, uh, phenomenon occurs in about uh, 10 to 15 percent of adolescents, um, very similar to the prevalence in adults. So we actually think that this is the same group of, of patients that just grow older from adolescence into adulthood um, because we don't think that these varicoceles seem to spontaneously resolve over time. Most do occur in boys who are older than 10 years of age. Um, we think that it progresses through puberty and tends to peak at a tanner stage around uh, stage three. Um, you can see varicoceles in younger boys or uh, less um, uh, advanced through puberty, uh, but it does tend to be more prevalent in our older adolescent males. Most of the time, as we all know, they do occur on the left. There are um, reports, obviously, of right-sided varicoceles for a variety of reasons, and those reports, both anecdotally and uh, published reports, are increasing in frequency. Um, they do occur bilaterally in a subset of cases, <laughs> depending on which, um, which set of uh, literature you pick up and read. Um, that can be a relatively small number or a significant number up to half of patients having some degree of bilateral varicocele. Um, the pathophysiology is multifactorial. 
Sometimes um, we talk about increased venous pressure in the left renal vein. We can also talk about collateral venous anastomoses um, that can contribute to uh, venous stasis and uh, pooling within the veins themselves. We also talk about valve incompetence of the left internal spermatic vein at its junction with the left renal vein that may contribute to um, a lack of propulsion uh, forward of the uh, venous blood and result in the pooling within the pinpeniform plexus. Um, one famous test question that we've all come across uh, typically on in-service or maybe even on written boards would be the nutcracker phenomenon. And um, that's when there's compression of the left renal vein between the aorta and the superior, superior mesenteric artery um, that results in compression and obviously increased uh, back pressure and pooling of blood. Um, there's also thought to be just some in, uh, generalized venous incompetence um, because of concomitant varicose veins and other venous abnormalities in some men with uh, a varicocele. So in some of these patients, you might see generalized varicosities um, and other uh, venous diseases, venous stasis type diseases. And um, because of that, it's thought that perhaps there's some sort of incompetence that's occurring in a certain subset of the population that predisposes exposes them to having uh, varicoceles. Um, there's also a genetic component. It tends to be four to eight times higher incidence in first degree relatives, uh, and that is uh, highest in brothers. So you might see subsets that have uh, varicoceles, and um, uh, that's so certainly something to take note of uh, when doing an intake in history. Um, there's also um, body habitus uh, tends to play a role, low BMI, um, tall, lanky, thin people tend to have more varicosities, uh, which tends to go counter to what you might expect, um, but multiple studies have shown that, um, and uh, certainly something just to make note of as well. So how do we um, diagnose these and, and classify uh, these uh, findings? Well, the majority are incidental. A child goes into the primary care physician, maybe for a well child check or a sports physical. Child has not even noticed it, um, or at least claims not to. Uh, we, we think that maybe, um, you, you know, adolescents are a little sheepish in discussing things that involve their um, genitalia, and um, maybe they're just not reporting that. Um, but uh, in any event, most do seem to be incidental findings. Um, Sometimes in a group of patients, they might complain of pain um, in, in um, various different complaints, usually a dull, achy pain, sometimes even a sharp pain is reported. Um, of the people that report pain, most of those reports are following uh, prolonged activity up on their feet or heavy uh, lifting. Um, some of the patients that I've seen in practice uh, that have come in reporting pain are my football players who have noticed the pain occurs after working out in the weight room. I've had a marching band um, high school students that have been practicing for hours with their instruments, marching on the football field and up on their feet, and uh, just have reported a dull, achy, or heavy throbbing type feeling, and uh, that's uh, how their complaints surface and their findings are detected. Uh, when you see these patients in your office, it's important to examine them in both uh, the sitting and laying positions um, and also use Valsalva to elucidate vein enlargement. Um, the importance of uh, putting them in the supine position after having them either sit or stand is important because um, most varicoceles should decompress when the patient is in the laying position and if it does not, it should raise some red flags and we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, so how do we classify varicoceles? Obviously, there's a grading system I'm sure the majority of you guys have heard of. Um, a, a subclinical varic varicocele is graded as a grade zero, and it's detected only by ultrasound. So these patients may be getting an ultrasound because they're complaining of pain um, or for other reasons, uh, and a, a small varicocele is detected uh, on Doppler flow. Grade one is palpable only with Valsalva. So going back to the first, um, the first point in the examination uh, is why it's critically important to incorporate the Valsalva maneuver into your routine physical examination.
A grade two varicocele is one that is palpable on physical exam, but not visible. So uh, the child or the referring physician or the pediatric urologist may feel that through the scrotal wall skin, but it is not something that either you or the child would have visibly seen before then. And then grade three is the highest grade, and that's one that's easily visible through the scrotal skin. Um, and uh, one of my mentors said that's the kind that you can see across the room on exam. So there's no doubt uh, you would get a, an ultrasound to confirm that presence, but you know it when you see it, and it, it clearly is that bag of worms that we mentioned at the very beginning. So things to note on exam, as I mentioned on the earlier slide, veins should decompress when patient is in the supine position. Failure to do so, especially if this is on the right side, does warrant an evaluation for either a pelvic or a retroperitoneal mass. Um, so that mass would cause a mass effect, and that mass effect will not be resolved by a change in position, and so there will not be resolution of that venous stasis or the venous pooling, and, um, and that should immediately raise your red flags and uh, cause you to do a workup with either an ultrasound or even CT is often talked about uh, in our uh, pediatric urology literature. We should also look at testicular consistency. Uh, the affected testicle, so the testicle on the side of the um, varicocele is often softer in comparison to the unaffected side, and so that's something to make note of uh, because we would want to follow that over time. If it is um, similar in consistency to the unaffected side, and then as we follow the patient, that changes, that is certainly something that would want to, um, uh, we would want to look at a little more closely. Testicular volume. This is a, a critical thing in my personal opinion. Um, we can uh, really assess a lot about the impact of the varicocele based on the impact on testicular growth. So we want to look at testicular volume. There's a couple different ways to do that. We could use orchidometers um, and, you know, we could either use the beads um, or um, do a, a, a measurement or use the orchidometer that has the whole cut out and you can measure the testicular volume using that. Um, but ultrasound is probably much more sensitive, not probably, it is more sensitive and studies have definitely proven that. Um, and we'll be ordering ultrasounds anyway to look at um, uh, the actual venous um, pooling around the testicle. So be sure to communicate with your ultrasonographers and your radiologists at your institutions and, and make sure that they are consistently providing you with um, testicular volumetric measurements when they're giving you an ultrasound as well, because that's critically important to understanding both the current situation and following these patients over time. So uh, why do we care? Um, about varicoceles. We've talked about the fact that we don't really understand their impact um, and um, you know many men go on to father children uh, but clearly there's something to them or there wouldn't be surgeries to fix them right. So uh, we do talk about injuries related to increased body temperature um, but th that injury is poorly understood. Um, there's also the theory of oxidative stress related to free radicals when uh, the blood is um, uh, pooled and static around uh, the testicle. Uh, we know, as we mentioned earlier, in the importance of uh, measuring the testicular volume, that this, uh, the presence of varicoceles can alter testicular growth. Um, it's very important to, again, assess uh, the volume of the affected side, and uh, we're specifically looking at a decrease in testicular volume of the affected side as compared to the unaffected side. Um, so these were some startling numbers that I came across in preparing for this um, talk today, in that um, up to a third or slightly more than a third of boys with grade two varicoceles were noted to have a significant decrease in testicular volume. And um, really four fifths of those with a grade three varicocele showed a decrease in volume. Um, anecdotally, uh, I think that seems slightly higher than what I have seen in practice over the past, um, I guess, dozen years or so. Um, but I think the important take home message here is there seems to certainly be a 
correlation between um, growth of the testicle and um, the presence of a varicocele. And we can extrapolate that things grow when they're healthy and they're thriving. And so if something is not growing or even atrophying as we're following it, then that would um, be a proxy for assuming that there is some um, deleterious effects of varicoceles as it relates to testicular health. Um, because this uh, decrease in volume may improve after surgery, it has been thought that hypotrophy of the testicle was a sign of testicular injury related to the varicocele. Um, so we do talk about the catch-up growth of a testicle, and that is um, theorized to happen after you repair the varicocele. You would follow that patient postoperatively and see if the affected testicle uh, catches up in growth as compared to the uh, contralateral or unaffected side. However, uh, the caveat with uh, talking about and watching out for catch-up growth postoperatively is that we know that even in an unrepaired varicocele, you can see um, this catch-up growth happen spontaneously. Uh, so there's a theory of discrepant testicular growth such that as the boy progresses through puberty, both sides do not necessarily grow at the same rate at the same time. You might see the right side grow. And so if you did a snapshot in time, it would look like there's some uh, discrepancy between the two sides. But then if you did another ultrasound, and this, this is even in boys without varicoceles, uh, that on the next ultrasound or the next clinic visit, the left side would have grown to maybe even catch up with the right or exceed the growth velocity of the right side. And so if you did a snapshot in time at that point, it might look like the right one is uh, declined in volume compared to the left. So we know that this catch-up growth can happen even without uh, repair of the varicocele, so it further contributes to the controversy that uh, goes along with the topic of varicocele overall. So if we're using growth or volume as a proxy for how testicles are doing um, that are affected by varicoceles, it is difficult to use that when we see some boys with varicoceles um, initially having what's thought to be a growth discrepancy, but ultimately um, not uh, showing that on down the road. Um, so the definition of testicular hypotrophy has varied greatly, but most of us have kind of settled on a cutoff of around 20% compared to the unaffected side. And again, that harkens back to there is some asymmetry in all body parts, and so you're not going to see uh, exact uh, volume measurements uh, between the left and right sides. And so we have to settle on some certain definition at which it's no longer physiologic, but perhaps pathophysiologic, that um, uh, that there is a difference between um, the testicular volumes. And so 20% is, is um, essentially where uh, the flag should be raised when we're looking at testicular volume measurements in boys affected by varicoceles. Um, and as I said earlier, it's very important. If there's one take home point um, that I could send home with each of you, this is what I, I drive into the residents and fellows who work with me, that it's very important, very important, not to use a single measurement as a decision maker for intervention, as it really is a snapshot in time. It's really better to use longitudinal measurements over time because of the variability of testicular growth, especially as boys uh, are progressing through puberty and have not uh, been fully matured in the pubertal process. Um, there have been multiple studies that have looked at hormonal function changes as they may relate to boys with varicoceles, uh, looking at various levels of FSH, LH, uh, gonadotropin, and inhibin B. Um, and these studies have been, have been inconclusive. You will have one study that shows an increase in hormonal function and another study that shows a decrease or no change whatsoever. And so those are really difficult to interpret as it might relate to the overall impact um, and problem of a varicocele. So um, at this time, we don't really assess hormonal function or use that as a basis as, uh, for decision makers about what to do for boys with varicoceles. Um, so why do we care? Uh, additionally, there is Im impaired sper spermatogenesis in boys. Um, this is a very difficult one, right? Because in adults, when, when we were in residency and we were talking about treating adults, often within the context of male infertility, um, 
we would always frame that within the course of uh, a, a semen analysis that um, had some abnormalities within it. However, the actual act of even discussing a semen analysis with a boy who's 14 in your clinic and his mom is sitting next to him is oftentimes at best awkward and at worst quite um, problematic to even have that frank discussion um, as the boys kind of shy away. Mom doesn't want to think about the process that that entails of, of taking her son um, to, to go obtain a semen analysis. Um, and, um, and oftentimes, you know, important to many of us is it's not necessarily covered by insurance as well. So just the, the idea of having that conversation uh, for the parent and the child is extremely awkward and difficult. Um, and uh, obtaining the sample can be difficult as we know that ejaculation often doesn't uh, physiologically happen until boys. Uh, Boys reach an age of at least 13 or 14. So if you're looking at one of these kids, it's maybe 10 or 11. We don't even have the opportunity to obtain a semen analysis. Um, and then for those older boys that we do have a semen analysis, um, we uh, uh, don't really have what true norms are for semen analyses, um, especially uh, on the various tanner stages. There's no set um, normal or standard based on tanner stages or ages that exist. And we often will say that um, it's really best to obtain a semen analysis and um, uh, interpret that semen analysis on someone who is fully matured throughout the pubertal process. Um, the total testicular volume does seem to correlate with total modal sperm count. Uh, and what that means is the differential greater than 20% um, often will double the odd of a low total sperm count on boys when you do get a semen analysis. So although the implications may not be exactly clear, um, the, the facts remain fairly consistent and fairly evident in that um, the, the volume, the impacts that you see is related to volume often um, do seem to impact the finding at least on uh, motility um, of a semen analysis. Um, however, after you repair a varicocele, the postoperative catch-up growth does not necessarily correlate with improvement in semen quality ultimately. So that's another conundrum that we have that's the real head scratcher is, you know, if, if we're doing this based on abnormalities in sperm count and we may or may not see catch-up growth either with or without repair and that may or may not impact semen analysis ultimately, which may or may not impact paternity ultimately, it's really hard to make solid uh, decisions and recommendations about the best uh, clinical decisions for these patients. So ultimately the waters are really muddy, obviously, because most men with varicoceles have no issues fathering children. And, and so it becomes this cycle of, we think it's a problem, here's some things that support that, but here's some things that refute it. And so it's really difficult for us, and I, I love banking on a sure thing, and this is really hard to, to uh, counsel uh, kids that aren't necessarily even thinking about being a father at that moment in time, and, and parents that don't wanna think about their kids doing things that make them fathers. And so uh, these, these can be uh, fraught with a lot of uh, difficult discussions in clinic. Um, so what, what are some things that might prompt us to do something? So we know why we care, but when do we care? So some of the indications for surgery might be pain. We talked a little bit, um, you know, one of the earlier slides, we talked about how it's maybe 10% or less of patients have pain. So that is a relative indication. And we also know that even of that group that presents initially with pain, for those that go on to seek repair and undergo repair of their varicocele, it's still a small subset of that group that still has postoperative pain persistent following surgery. Um, so pain 
you know, is, is one of those things that we need to be really careful about as, as using that as an indication for surgery. And certainly if you do, you need to counsel and document with, uh, counsel your patients and document uh, that discussion that you cannot guarantee resolution of the pain after repair of that varicocele. That's a very important fact. Um, fertility, that's really tricky as we just spent a lot of time talking about moments ago. Um, but fertility is certainly something that makes us care. And the idea is, is that we would love to fix something before it becomes a problem, but we don't really understand exactly the, the relationship and the implications long-term of varicoceles as it relates to fertility. Um, again, uh, semen analysis is best utilized instead of an esoteric uh, idea of maybe it impacts fertility. It's nice to have that concrete, here's the abnormality that we see on semen analysis. But then again, just to emphasize, um, it's really difficult to use a semen analysis in boys that have not fully progressed through puberty because there's no set norms. Um, if there's no set norms, we don't know how to call something abnormal. And if something is not clearly abnormal, it's difficult to use that for surgical decision making. That's why most of us would fall back on testicular size discrepancy of greater than 20%, because that's concrete, right? Um, the, the pain, that's relative. Only a few people uh, report that, or a small group of patients report that. It may persist. Pain can be caused from lots of things. Maybe they happen to have a varicocele and have just orcalgia, which we know can happen uh, or you know the vague groin pain that some um, athletes and, and, and boys that are going through growing pains associated with puberty might have. So pain's difficult. Fertility, it's tricky, but testicular size discrepancy, that's something that's reproducible, right, on ultrasound. And so if we meet the magic uh, mark of 20% or more uh, a discrepant volume size, it's, it's easy to use that. Um, but again, the one thing uh, that I love for you to hear me say is don't use it based on a single study. Um, and it's because of the variability and in, in growth through pubertal stages. And you might get tricked into thinking that there's a discrepancy, whereas in fact, if you would just wait, uh, repeat the ultrasound, you might see that discrepancy change. Um, so here's a little graphic kind of looking at um, uh, how you might um, do decision making as it might relate to these, these boys. Um, so growth arrest tends to be at the top, as I was just saying. Um, other testicular conditions which might affect fertility, uh, including abnormal semen analyses. Certainly, if it's bilateral, um, then whatever may or may not be going on is clearly affecting both sides at that point. So you might put those into a different category. Um, large size, obviously, the larger it is, the more it might cause discomfort. Um, it might cause distortion of the scrotum. Um, it, we talked a little bit earlier about looking at the consistency of the testicle during the physical exam. So that might be something. If you notice a clear difference between the two, one is normal and, uh, you know, the normal testicular consistency is kind of firm, but the affected side is squishy and soft, then clearly you might think there is a difference between the two, and we may be able to pin that uh, accurately or inaccurately on the varicocele and use that as yet another um, uh, case for uh, repair. Uh, pain, as we talked about, um, abnormal hormonal testing, not really uh, used very much, but in theory, um, more or less from a research standpoint, you could, you could certainly use that. Anxiety is always one, and we tend to see that more in the adolescent boys. Uh, I hear lots of, I don't want people looking at me in the locker room. I don't want to be different than everybody else. And so that certainly is something that we've all heard before. I think we have to do our due diligence and um, really investigate that with the children, but we shouldn't dismiss it. Um, there's a lot, a lot that goes into that um, uh, self-esteem and anxiety in uh, the adolescent youth. Uh, so our best practice policy, this was written several years ago, but still stands in the um, uh, guidelines through the AUA or the best practices through the AUA. Adolescents who have a varicocele and objective evidence of reduced ipsilateral testicular size should be offered repair. So it's offered, you, it's not a guideline you should do the repair, but you should offer them that repair. 
they deserve that full discussion with you about the pros and the cons, the potential benefits, potential risks, um, and then, you know, have shared decision making. Adolescents who have a varicocele, but normal its lateral testicular size, should be offered follow-up monitoring with annual objective measurements of testicular size and or semen analyses. So uh, I would say that um, most of our practices would fall in line with that. So how do we repair? Well, uh, for most of the fellows, you're gonna repair it the way that your attendings uh, feel comfortable doing, but you've got to ultimately decide what, uh, what method um, you feel most comfortable with and which one that you would ultimately ascribe to as far as um, outcomes and uh, potential risks. There's multiple approaches. There's inguinal and subinguinal. These are often uh, microscopic uh, or, or performed with the assistance of an operating microscope or even loop magnification. Um, then there's a laparoscopic or retroperitoneal, essentially the same approach, the same surgical concepts, but obviously one done in an open nature and one done uh, through minimally invasive methods. And then there's non-surgical embolization that our uh, IR colleagues would uh, assist us with. So some decision-making factors uh, in the process of uh, doing surgery are, you know, are we artery sparing people or not? Um, are we sparing lymphatics or not? Certainly pros and cons to all of these. Um, what are the risks that the varicocele may recur in the future? And then uh, one of the most common complications that we might see are hydrocele risks. So uh, each one of these approaches, um, you know, are linked to different recurrence risks and uh, complication risks. Um, the interesting thing about hydrocele is they may not be an immediate phenomenon postoperatively. These may take up to two years to develop, and so for um, a lot of our patients, we may not, um, if we're not following these these kids long term, we may not catch that. So that's very important, and it's also important when you look at the literature. Um, discussing a particular repair or even comparing repairs and they're talking about complications and outcomes, very important to look at the median and uh, median follow-up and then ranges of follow-up because if you're if these studies are not going out to two years or longer, we may be missing some of the complications and so you know you need to take that particular study with a grain of salt. Of those with hydrocele, up to half will require intervention. So not all hydrocele's ultimately result in the need to do something. We'll start with subinguinal or inguinal microsurgery. Um, so the benefits to performing this particular approach um, is that it provides the ability for the surgeon to spare both the artery and um, lymphatics uh, during the, the process. Um, the success rates are high and um, there seem to be reported um, risk, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, low risk of uh, hydrocele's um, afterwards. Uh, however, the downside to this is um, it is time consuming. Um, obviously, there's um, more equipment. You have to be trained uh, to use an operating uh, microscope. Your team has to be trained how to set all of this up. Um, and it takes some time if you're going to go in and, as the lower left picture would imply, uh, seek out and isolate all the various structures involved with the spermatic cord. Um, you know, that takes a, a degree of diligence and, um, and uh, time in the operating room. Uh, that some may consider uh, when you look at uh, comparisons between techniques. Some may consider that um, that amount of time spent in the OR may not necessarily compare with the, the changes or, or improvements in outcomes. So another option, obviously, is a laparoscopic or retroperitoneal approach. So the Palomo is the open technique done with a, a transverse incision just medial to the um, iliac crest. Um, and you would ligate the entire spermatic cord. Um, the laparoscopic approach is the same technique, but done through a minimally invasive approach. Um, using um, just the uh, straight lap technique. Um, I think this is a pretty, 
quick and easy surgery. And I don't know that there would ever be a rule for a robotic assisted approach. I think that might be overkill unless you're just really looking to use your robot. Um, in the interest of full disclosure, this would be how I would perform the surgery. Um, and so I can um, uh, speak from a personal standpoint about this uh, as far as uh, the specific laparoscopic technique might go. Um, and um, in an informal kind of poll that I did of a lot of my colleagues just asking for their approach, this does seem to be um, the, the approach probably with the most frequent uh, hands up as far as that's the way that I do it sort of thing. So uh, these approaches provide high success rates for surgery. They are efficient. It's a fairly quick procedure. Um, and from the standpoint of training, I actually think it's a brilliant procedure. It's great to let residents and even um, our fellows get some, um, get some time using the traditional laparoscopic equipment. It's some good, easy dissection. It doesn't take long, so you can afford some time spent in instruction. So this is a great, uh, what I would call a, um, you know, a, a, a great resident benefit case. <laughs> so um, there are reportedly higher rates of hydrocele formation. Uh, with this, um, you can uh, adopt an uh, artery and lymphatic sparing techniques uh, to, to potentially decrease those hydrostill rates, but they can also decrease success rates. Um, for reasons, quite frankly, not clearly understood, um, if you are sparing them more proximally as, composed to, uh, as opposed to more distally with the microscopic, uh, you know, why that might change, but nonetheless, uh, the reports stand that uh, by attempting to spare the artery and um, lymphatics, you might affect in a negative way your success rates. Um, testicular atrophy could potentially be a concern because you are ligating the entire cord. Um, it does seem to be a risk, um, a higher risk in those patients with a history of prior inguinal surgeries or um, even uh, uh, patients on whom you're doing varicocele repair now but in the future, they go on to require a surgery that could potentially compromise vasal vessels like hernia repair or vasectomy later in life. Um, when talking about the laparoscopic approach, I'm sure a lot of you have been exposed to that, even uh, through residency or, <clears throat> excuse me, in your current fellowship. There is a myriad of ways that uh, the laparoscopic approach can be done as far as the templates with which um, to place your ports. Um, and there's uh, essentially no right or wrong way. Some people will put their working ports in the bilateral lower quadrants. Some, patient, uh, some surgeons will do one working port in the lower midline and one on the ipsilateral lower quadrant. Um, uh, essentially, I, I think the, the thing to do is to triangulate your ports so that you've got good view and you're not fighting with yourself. Um, so a lot of it depends on body habitus as well. Um, and, and ultimately, there's not necessarily a benefit, technically speaking, to one port site placement versus another. It really truly depends on ergonomics and surgeon preference as far as that goes. Um, then just to talk briefly about uh, embolization and sclerotherapy. Um, these, again, would be things done by our um, colleagues in interventional radiology. Uh, they can do coils or uh, sclerotherapy agents uh, to, um, to embolize the internal spermatic veins. Um, these do have lower success rates, um, but the trade-off is that they can be done under local anesthesia. There are um, varying reports of um, just the inability to complete the procedure. So uh, an interventional radiologist may uh, start out doing this or they're unable to effectively coil or embolize uh, the vein and uh, the patient then need a subsequent procedure to ultimately take care of the problem itself. Um, additionally, it does involve radiation exposure and this is obviously something that we're particularly attuned to in our pediatric patient population, even the older kids like adolescents. Um, and we are trying to minimize that, especially in, in the current um, uh, practice environments. And so that's certainly something to consider along the way.
Um, just, uh, you know, if you look, there's a lot of articles, a lot of meta-analyses, um, a lot of literature reviews, um, looking at the various procedures and trying to compare them as far as recurrence rates, complication rates, um, and long-term outcomes. And um, it, depending on which one you look at, you do get slightly different um, outcomes and different numbers uh, in the various categories. I think the important things to note are that um, the microscopic approach seems to have the highest um, uh, rates of success as defined by lack of recurrence of the varicocele, as well as the lowest rates of, um, of hydrocele formation postoperatively. Um, and you know, this can be closely uh, mirrored by a laparoscopic approach that also spares the artery and uh, lymphatics. Um, I will say that I typically have not ascribed to um, artery and lymphatic sparing laparoscopic surgery. Um, it's difficult, even with the magnification under the laparoscopic uh, camera, to know for sure uh, what you've got is, is uh, artery or what you have is uh, lymphatics. I have uh, tried many times. I have not noticed a difference except in operative time. Um, I think my outcomes have been very uh, persistent, persistently the same, um, regardless if, you know, I spend the time trying to do that or not. Um, and I, in my, um, is I practice in the same place I did fellowship. And so I've been here 14 years and I've seen one hydrocele. Um, and, you know, I think that kind of speaks to the infrequency with which this occurs if done through any, any minimally invasive uh, technique uh, or under microscopic guidance. Um, so at the end of the day, I think that uh, ultimately a surgeon has to be comfortable with how she or he uh, performs the procedure, um, is confident on the technique, and uses good, consistent, reproducible technique. And if you notice a trend towards um, complications such as hydrocele's or recurrences, then uh, then it's time to be um, some you know, somewhat introspective about what you're doing and look to see if there's anything that you can do differently. So my recommendation is to do what you're comfortable with doing and keep track of your outcomes and do not be afraid to change approach if your outcomes suggest that that should be considered. Um, I include sclerotherapy as part of this conversation because it's technically in the books and I think everybody should be aware of it, but I think the data would show that unless the patient's just a poor surgical candidate or averse to anesthesia or something along those lines, I'm not sure that sclerotherapy is as great a benefit now as uh, previously thought, uh, now that our microscopic techniques are better and that our minimally invasive approaches are better. So in summary, um, the implications of adolescent varicocele are <laughs> somewhat uncertain, and I think that's uh, saying it nicely. Uh, the indication for repair in adolescence is relatively narrow, and it should be. Quite honestly, we're, we're doing something that can potentially have risks uh, to patients. And I think anytime we have uh, surgery, we have, uh, especially in children, we should have relatively narrow indications for those. Um, testicular size discrepancy, again, is the most widely used, uh, and again, that threshold is over 20% difference between the two. Uh, but again, one last time, that, that take-home point is that we need uh, more than a single ultrasound on which to base this, uh, this measurement and the decision-making involved with that. Um, there are relative indications such as pain and self-esteem that certainly should not be dismissed. Um, and then, you know, the semen analysis is difficult at best in this patient population. The approach to repair is varied. Each approach has its individual risks and benefits. All are relatively successful, and uh, surgeon preference and comfort level is important in determining the best uh, way forward. Um, many or m most adolescents can be conservatively observed with serial ultrasounds and uh, exams. And I, I think if there's a second take home point that I would say is a lot of times in surgery, we have to know when not to operate on children. And I think it's important to understand if we don't clearly know 
that we're doing something good, then it's very, very um, reasonable and, and responsible um, to maybe not do anything at all until there's a clear reason to do so. So um, don't underestimate conservative management of these patients. And if that uh, path is chosen through shared decision making, um, then we shouldn't just have them follow up PRN. These should be kids that come back at least yearly uh, for exams. I tell my patients to do a monthly self-exam, recognizing that teenage boys often aren't going to do that, uh, not with medical things in mind. But you tell them to examine their testicles, check the sizes. If they notice any difference, you teach them about consistency of the testicles, like how they feel. Um, and if they notice differences, they don't need to be embarrassed or feel awkward about bringing those up. And we tell them in front of the parents and tell the parents to check with them. Um, you know, if this were any other body part, there wouldn't be shame or stigma in, in reporting a problem. And so they don't need to feel that in reporting a problem here. Um, so, uh, so don't be afraid to not operate on these kids. Uh, and again, I always tell the people that I train, um, it's always about keeping your oath. So first, do no harm. So sometimes we know that we can hurt kids. Uh, if it's not clear that we can help them, then maybe we don't do anything at all. And so that's a very important point to remember, not just about varicoceles, but if I can leave you with one thing as you go forward throughout your training and even into your practice life, uh, it's remember to keep your oath. So uh, I'm from Memphis, and I would just say thank you very much uh, from the, the king of rock and roll. Um, I know that Michelle has asked that uh, I show this uh, QR code, and so if you guys want to scan that or visit the website that's there on the screen, um, they would love to, to hear your thoughts or take a survey. Um, so I have a few minutes. I think there's a QA and a um, thing that you guys can do, and so I'll read some of the questions, and we can kind of talk through there. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, the first um, anonymous attendee has, has said, how much time would you keep following a patient if you see a decrease in size of greater than 30% of the testicle? Does the duration of follow-up differ depending on the percentage of hypotrophy? So I'm sure like many things, you might get different answers if you ask different people. Uh, for me, I would get at least one other ultrasound uh, three to six months after the first one. I think any sooner than three months, you're probably not going to see any appreciable catch-up growth on which to base your decisions. I think waiting longer than six months uh, could potentially be detrimental, and I think that sweet spot of three to six months after after that initial ultrasound uh, showing the, the discrepancy, I think if you're going to see some catch-up growth, you'll at least see that window or that gap narrowing, um, and you'll either feel more confident about waiting another three to six months, or you'll feel more confident about proceeding. Um, so I have not used um, duration of follow-up. Uh, so, so the follow-up question was, does the duration of follow-up differ depending on the percentage of hypotrophy. I have not used any type of a nomogram or um, a, a chart that says if it's X percent, then you follow for X months before getting the next ultrasound. Um, a lot of this is just gut. Obviously, if there is a massive gap between the two testicles, I'm going to uh, feel a little bit more cautious and, and possibly see those kids back sooner than if uh, it's a little bit closer uh, between the two sizes, um, but I don't have a specific uh, time frame depending on the specific uh, amount difference that there are. Um, if, if that hasn't answered the question, feel free to uh, type in another um, question there. Um, so Marcos has said, what to do if you perform semen analysis and got azoospermia? Is it fair to give this information to the boy or family? Permanent infertility diagnosed at 14 will cause more harm than benefit. So I, I think it's very fair to give the information to the boy and the family because it's their health information and I think that they deserve to know that. Um, and honestly, at that point, I would absolutely push that patient into the hands of one of my infertility colleagues because I would have exhausted my uh, experience with regards to um, really how to counsel that family. I, I think anytime you get a result that's surprising, the, one of the first things that I would always do would be to repeat that, but then also get them in the hands of somebody whose specific scope of practice deals with the very thing that they are looking at. And so even though they're 14, I think that they would need 
um, counseling. Uh, but anytime something is so far outside of what you would expect, I always say repeat it because certainly lab accidents uh, or uh, mislabeling specimens or things like that can, can happen. Um, Katie has asked, if you are following a patient with a varicocele, would you order yearly ultrasound for objective measure of testicle size or trust your physical exam for size discrepancy? Absolutely order the ultrasound. Um, there are some, some good studies, and one was recently, I think maybe e-published or, or perhaps I just uh, uh, proofed an article, um, looking at the difference between um, ultrasounds and physical exams. And we tend to, we, well, it goes in both directions. We can overestimate and underestimate depending on, um, you know, scrotal wall size, body habitus, um, you know, adipose tissue, things like that. I think that it's um, dangerous to base both surgical decisions and non-surgical follow-up decisions um, on physical exam alone. Um, I, I am a fan of the ultrasound. I think it is a useful study that's typically covered by insurance, so it does not uh, represent high cost to the patient, um, nor high cost to the system. And uh, it's non-invasive, uh, does not hurt or harm the patient, and it has no radiation exposure. So in my book, I feel more confident with an ultrasound, and there's not a lot of downside. Um, so I think anytime we can feel confident without putting the patient through too much, that's always a win for us surgeons. Um, Okay, the next question, would you use embolization in recurrent cases only, or do you use it as a first-line treatment? I don't use it at all. Um, <laughs> I, I don't, I mean, I'm a surgeon, and I think I, my predilection is towards surgery and not towards my interventional radiology colleagues. Um, they're great people, but I think for varicoceles, um, I think that every study I've ever seen shows that surgery definitely um, is better as far as outcomes and um, complication rates compared to embolization. Um, so I, I certainly, uh, for me, would not consider it for first-line treatment in the pediatric population. Maybe if I was dealing with an adult with multiple comorbidities, um, someone who just could not undergo anesthesia or things like that, uh, that certainly might uh, raise embolization up on my list a bit. Um, but otherwise, I don't know that that would be, um, you know, one that I would uh, consider certainly as first-line therapy. As far as recurrent cases, I think it's probably patient-dependent. I would want to know, I, um, maybe it's luck and I'm going gonna, um, I'm gonna to knock on my wooden desk here, but I've not yet had any recurrences in doing laparoscopic varicoceles. And, and again, maybe I've gotten lucky, so I haven't had to work my way through this. Um, but, you know, the old mantra of doing the same thing twice, but expecting different results the second time around holds true. So certainly if I had a recurrence, I would consider not approaching it in the same fashion since I do laparoscopic surgery. I think that for a recurrence that I might see, I might transition to a colleague who specializes in microsurgery um, as, you know, like in a subinguinal approach or inguinal approach. So that would probably be how I would handle that type of a case. Uh, Jenny says, in your opinion, what is the better approach for these patients? I think it's clear. <laughs> That um, I think surgery is better than um, I think surgery is better than embolization. If we're talking about intervention, I think what you feel comfortable with is the best approach. I feel comfortable with laparoscopic surgery, um, but I think that there is a strong uh, argument to be made for doing nothing and being incredibly selective with those that you take to the operating room. I can't uh, overstate that enough. That is definitely something that. Um, that I try to build confidence in, in my, uh, my fellows and my residents is really making sure that you feel confident about when not to operate. Uh, and sometimes the best thing that you can do for patients is not operating. So maybe the better approach is to wait and see until you have very clear reasons to be in the OR. And then if you're in the OR, personally for me, it would be laparoscopic. Um, but if you're trained at microsurgical techniques and that is where your comfort level is, then obviously, um, you know, that's a good approach too. I think you can't go wrong if you're doing good technique. Outcomes are very good. Complication rates overall are quite low. Um, so it's a, it's a good, a good surgery to fix a questionable problem. Uh, Francisco says, what about the scrotal or antegrade tauber sclerotherapy or embolization? I would have to, um, I would have to let my IR colleagues kind of weigh in on this. 
Um, I know that when you talk about uh, sclerotherapy um, and embolization, there's antegrade and retrograde techniques. Um, and there's some pros and cons that are put in um, uh, those categories. Um, and, you know, one is often more invasive than the other, but um, I, I wouldn't be able to wax eloquent on that. Um, what do you do with recurrent varicocele post varicocele surgery? So I think we kind of touched on that. Um, and then uh, again, uh, I would um, decide if we need to do something, you don't always need to do something, but if we're going to do something, uh, then I think I certainly wouldn't necessarily do the same thing twice. Uh, what uh, Javier says, what would be your advice about what treatment and a recurrence with two previous inguinal surgeries? So I think there it's, it, it is a little bit more obvious that an artery uh, sparing technique is helpful because theoretically uh, you may have already affected the vasal vessels. And so it's, it's uh, you know, important to tread lightly in those areas. So I think that uh, doing something that spares artery and lymphatics is very important. Um, so I think that that would bump up either an artery or lymphatic sparing laparoscopic approach or a microsurgical approach in that case. Um, what technique would you use for occurrence? That seems to be a common question, you guys. Um, so, uh, so again, um, this person says, what technique would you use for recurrence, uh, question mark, lap, question mark. So if I did a laparoscopic repair and there was recurrence, I don't think I would go back in laparoscopically. I think at that point um, you would try to do something um, inguinally. Uh, you know, you could um, put a scope in under anesthesia and see if for some reason part of the cord wasn't effectively clipped or ligated, um, you know, if there was something that was missed along the way. One thing I did not touch on was um, the fact that people have tried to use dyes to differentiate the arteries and, and lymphatics uh, in the process of doing minimally invasive or laparoscopic surgery. And um, there's been varying degrees of complications reported with that. Um, anywhere from skin necrosis, which is very serious, to somebody having a blue scrotum for like a week after surgery, and they're very upset with that. So in general, trying to elucidate um, the specific spermatic cord structures with the use of dyes during surgery um, right now hasn't been very successful. Um, you know, phosphorescence might be a different, um, you know, kind of like the firefly things that we use with robots might be different in the future, but right now um, with what we have, I, I, I don't know that that's something that very, um, very commonly gets used anymore. So I think that has done it for all the, why no, no, I'm sorry. Um, okay, I know effects on fertility are, co are controversial, but what do you say, what do I actually say to parents? This may or may not have an effect, wait and see. That's a hard conversation. It's a conversation that um, you really have to, first of all, you have to feel out um, who you're talking to. It's that old phrase I tell people, you gotta know your audience. You have to know what people can handle and on what level you talk to them. I think there's different ways you share the same information depending on your listener and the ability that they have with uh, you know, their healthcare literacy uh, to accept that information and interpret it. I think that you tell them all the things that we just talked about, but in terms that they can understand. Here's what we know. We know that semen analysis may or may not show abnormalities. It's unclear what that means. And at the end of the day, you share information and then you ask them, you know, what they feel comfortable with. And, and it depends, they have to analyze their own risk aversiveness versus risk tolerance. Um, are they more comfortable taking a gamble that surgery may help? Um, so you, you look at the does it help or does it hurt uh, discussion with surgery uh, versus the gamble on if you do nothing now, could it potentially become a long-term problem? And that's, a, that's a difficult decision. I try to put myself in the place of my patients all the time. I'm a, I'm a mom of an almost teenage boy, and what would I do if I were in their situation? And honestly, as a parent who has the probably the best understanding compared to my patients and the families anyway, um, I'm not even sure what I would do in that case. And so that really kind of sums it up in a nutshell is I'm not, I'm not sure what I would do if it were my son. Um, 
And then uh, it looks like uh, one of the final questions is, what is your approach in case of recurrence of laparoscopic surgery? So I think it's reasonable. I say don't do the same thing twice. Um, I, I should have clarified that to say, I think it's reasonable to discuss under general anesthesia, looking in with the laparoscope, making sure parts of the spermatic cord were not missed or clips have not fallen off. Some people uh, ligate only and don't transect the cord. There was a, a a uh, paper that came out when I was in training, uh, what feels like a lifetime ago, <laughs> that said that if you clip but don't uh, transect the cord, you might actually decrease your rates of hydrocele's. Um, but certainly if you do that and then you it, your clips fall off or, or something like that happens or you've missed part of the cord or, or what have you, which is easier, uh, I mean, can actually happen. It, it sounds like it would be crazy to think about missing part of the cord, but um, for people that are obese, sometimes it can be difficult to see the full extent of the cord. And so I think it's reasonable looking with the laparoscope, see if anything like that has occurred. If the cord looks completely ligated, everything looks great, everything is intact, I'm not sure that ligating it again will bring about a different result, at least laparoscopically, so it may be time to uh, consider a different approach in that case. Um, so there, I think those are all the questions. I'm gonna check the chat and see. Yeah, I think that's it. So, um, oh. Okay, so um, Dr. Kopp has asked, will I address when we stop following a kid that has a varicocele and stable testicular sizes? Um, so basically, how long do you follow them? I follow them until Tanner stage five, whatever age that may be. And then if they are stable at Tanner stage five, then I would just counsel them on long-term uh, monitoring for themselves. Um, that really comes into monthly serial exams. Um, and then I also counsel them in the presence of the family, because sometimes kids don't listen, that um, if they have stable testicular size, no clear indication for surgery, and we're going to let them proceed through life with a varicocele, that if they um, are attempting to become a parent, and they have not had successful fertility with six months of um, intently trying, then they should then seek help from a fertility specialist and consideration of repairing the varicocele at that time. So normally we would say wait 12 months before seeking help. For those people, I would counsel them to seek help sooner. So I, I do kind of send them out of my office with that, um, with that um, piece of advice and going into adulthood. So, um, I think that that is it. I appreciate everything, and um, you can uh, reach out through PGRFlow or even email me if you have any follow-up questions, but I appreciate everyone's wonderful questions. Very great, and thanks for keeping me on my toes. Uh, good luck to everybody. Thank you.